Today we're going to talk about our work on efficient parallel self-adjusting computation. I'm Daniel and this is joint work with Guy Blalock, Anubhav Bawija and Umut Ajar. So the motivation for our work is dynamic algorithms. So most modern data sets are not static, but they are dynamic, they are frequently changing. For example, the web graph. New pages, new hyperlinks are being added or removed all the time. And social network graphs have new users and new connections or deleted connections all the time. So to handle this, algorithm designers work on what we call dynamic algorithms, which maintain some useful information about a changing data set. For example, you might have a dynamic algorithm that allows you to query whether a particular edge is in the minimum spanning tree of a graph as you add and delete edges to and from the graph. Or you might have an algorithm that allows you to check whether a point is on the convex hull of a set of points as you add and remove points. The problem with dynamic algorithms is that they're very challenging to design and implement and they have to be designed for each individual problem at hand. One approach to overcome this is a technique called self-adjusting computation. Self-adjusting computation is a technique that allows us to automatically transform static algorithms into dynamic algorithms. At a high level, the idea is to track dependencies between writes to variables and then pieces of computation that read the values of those variables and use them. If an update then changes the value of some variable, the dependencies can be used to figure out which parts of the computation are now out of date and need to be re-ran with the new values, using what we usually call a change propagation algorithm. So, as an overview of what we do in this work, we'll talk about the ingredients of self-adjusting computation, and then we'll talk about what we use to make parallel self-adjusting computation work. We'll talk about our contributions and our theoretical results, and we'll also go over some experimental results as well. So the first ingredient that you need to do self-adjusting computation is a way of tracking read-write dependencies. The way that most frameworks, including ours, do this is to place dynamic variables inside what are usually called modifiable reference types. Then you make reads of these modifiable reference types explicit with an explicit read operation. This allows you to track precisely which parts of computations depend on the values of which variables. As an example in pseudocode here, the following block of code might read the value of left res and right res into two local variables x and y, and then write the result of x plus y into some other modifiable reference called res. We know then that if the values of left res or right res ever change, that this block of code is now out of date and needs to be reran in order to obtain the new correct value for res. The other challenge of doing self-adjusting computation is correctly ordering the computations, because when we rerun computations, they have to be reran in the correct order in order to get the correct result. In the sequential world, this isn't too hard. This is usually achieved with an order maintenance data structure and a priority queue that keeps computations pending re-execution sorted by order as given by the order maintenance data structure. However, this is slightly more challenging in parallel because there's no longer a total order on the computations and indeed we want to be able to rerun multiple computations in parallel if that's allowed. So for our work and our framework, we'll make a few assumptions. Programs are going to be written using nested fork join style parallelism, where one process can fork off two threads to run in parallel. Once they're complete, they join together and the original computation continues. We'll assume that modifiable reference types can only be written to once per computation. Note that of course, this means we can still update the value of a modifiable and then rerun the computation, just that we cannot write to the same modifiable more than once in one run of the algorithm. We'll assume that programs are race-free. In particular, this means that reads can only happen after a variable has been written to, and that multiple writes cannot race to write the same variable. Lastly, we'll assume that programs are deterministic. So if they run with the same input, they'll always produce the same output, 
Note that this doesn't stop us from implementing randomized algorithms, and indeed we've implemented a few in our benchmarks. It just means that the randomness has to be pre-generated and given as part of the input to the program, so that if reran, you'll use the same randomness as before and get the same output. So to summarize what our work contributes over existing work, previous work on parallel self-adjusting computation has been mostly experimental. They've shown that you can do parallel self-adjusting computation and get good experimental results, but none of them have bounds on the runtime of their change propagation algorithm. So in our work, we define a distance metric between two executions of the same algorithm on different inputs. We call this the computation distance, denoted W delta and it measures how much work exists in one of the computations but not the other. We then show a theorem that says that if you do a dynamic update to your input and it affects R delta reads, which means that R delta of the explicit read operations have different values in the modifiables than they did before, and that this update induces a computation distance of W delta, then change propagation can propagate the dynamic update in just order W delta plus R delta times H work, where H is the height of the computation tree that we'll define in a moment, called the RSP tree. So our framework is really built upon this idea of RSP trees. RSP trees are based on SP trees, or series parallel trees, which have previously been used in previous work for race detection. SP trees allow us to denote the order of the computations in a parallel algorithm by using S nodes to denote that the two children have to be ran sequentially and P nodes to denote that the two children can safely be ran in parallel. We then extend SP trees with read nodes or R nodes which track where these explicit read operations occur. Two reads are therefore safe to execute in parallel if and only if their lowest common ancestor in the RSP tree is a P node. As a quick example, we have some pseudocode here for a self-adjusting divide and conquer sum algorithm and a corresponding RSP tree on the right. We'll see this more in a moment. So our change propagation algorithm, which takes new values to modifiables and then updates the output to the algorithm is quite simple. When you write a new value to a modifiable, all the read nodes that read that modifiable are marked as affected. When you affect a read node, you mark all of the ancestor nodes in the RSP tree. Change propagation then simply consists in traversing the marked nodes of the RSP tree. When you traverse past an S node, the children have to be traversed sequentially, but if you meet a marked P node and both of its children are marked, you can traverse those children safely in parallel. When an affected read node is reached, it is then re-executed from scratch. And this re-execution may of course write to more modifiables, which affects new read nodes and then marks further nodes in the RSP tree. So let's go through an example. Here's our divide and conquer parallel sum algorithm again, and its corresponding RSP tree. Let's say that we do an update and we change the values of the first and fourth modifiable. Note that the input here is a sequence of four modifiables shown at the bottom. We first mark as affected the two read nodes that read these modifiables. We then mark their ancestors in the RSP tree. And then we begin traversing the RSP tree starting from the root. When the traversal reaches a P node and sees that its two children are both marked, it can traverse those two subtrees in parallel. Note that these parallel traversals here actually happen asynchronously, but for the purpose of this animation, we'll depict them synchronously. Once the traversal then reaches the affected R nodes, it looks at the read operation shown here on line three and re-executes it. In this case, it re-reads the values of the updated modifiables and writes new values to the modifiable res which in this case will be the two modifiables that we've now highlighted in red on the diagram. These modifiables then look at the read nodes that read them. They get marked as affected and their ancestors get marked and the traversal can continue. The traversal finds more marked nodes and proceeds down the tree, again reaching more affected read nodes. 
we look at the explicit read operation corresponding to these nodes, in this case on line 10 of the pseudocode, and it rereads the values and writes new values again to the modifiable denoted by res in the pseudocode, which are these two just underneath the root node in the diagram. The read node that reads them is marked as affected and its ancestors are marked. The traversal can then continue until it reaches this affected read node and then re-executes it just as before and writes the value into the final result modifiable shown in the bottom. And the update is now complete and the output is fully updated. To establish that this is correct relies on two quite simple facts. First, that the change propagation algorithm correctly visits and re-executes all affected read nodes. And second, that re-executing just the affected read nodes and no others is sufficient to update the computation. The first fact is easy to establish by induction on the sequential dependencies of the read nodes. The second fact simply follows from the write once restriction and from the fact that programs are deterministic meaning that once a value has been written to a modifiable in a rerun, we know that that value always survives to the output, since it can't be overwritten. So, since the contribution of our work over previous work is having bounds on the runtime, we look at the bounds on the work for change propagation that we just showed. So given two executions of the same algorithm, recall that we define a distance metric called the computation distance, denoted W delta, this measures how much work is performed by all of the affected read nodes that get reran. We then show that for a dynamic update that affects R delta read nodes and induces a computation distance of W delta, that the dynamic update can be propagated in order W delta plus R delta times H work, where H is the height of the RSP tree. Note that the height of the RSP tree is at most the span of the algorithm. So for any sensible parallel algorithm, which will have polylog span, this is at most a polylog overhead in the runtime. However, we've found that for all of the examples that we've analyzed, the height of the RSP tree is never more than order log n. So this seems to suggest that in the common case, the RSP tree is almost always height order log n, even for algorithms with a larger polylog span. Then, to get concrete bounds for specific algorithms implemented in our framework, it suffices to analyze what the computation distance is for your desired class of dynamic updates. For example, in the simple divide and conquer parallel sum algorithm, if we modify k of the input modifiables, it's easy to show that the computation distance and number of affected read nodes is k log 1 plus n over k, where n is the total size of the input. This shows that we can propagate an update in time that is not much worse than a handcrafted, manually written dynamic algorithm. To study its practical performance, we then implemented our library in C++. An example here is shown where we translate the pseudocode for our parallel divide and conquer sum algorithm into a concrete implementation in our library. You can see that the translation is fairly straightforward, and once you learn how to use the simple set of primitives for reading, allocating, and writing modifiables, everything looks pretty straightforward. Then, we studied the performance of our implementation with a few benchmarks. Here we'll show a subset of them. We have a spell check example which computes the minimum edit distance of a given string to a set of strings, filter on a binary search tree, and a simple ray tracer algorithm that renders a scene with three colored balls. In our table here, we denote the single threaded running time, the running time on 32 threads, where this is run on a 32 core machine, the running time with 32 hyper threads or 64 threads, and the parallel speed up. So first of all, it's interesting to look at the overhead of the initial run. This is how much extra work has to be performed when we run the first invocation of the algorithm before doing any dynamic updates. We note that this seems to depend heavily on the granularity of the computation. In the case of minimum edit distance, since the leaves of the computation are performing an edit distance computation which is rather expensive, all of the overhead by self-adjusting computation is almost entirely hidden, and you can see that the initial run is barely slower than the static algorithm. For filter on a binary search tree, which has slightly less granularity, you can see that there's a little bit of overhead, about a factor of two or so. For our ray tracer algorithm, this one is different to the first two, 
in that unlike the first two, which have a large number of modifiables in the input, each of which is only read a constant number of times, the ray tracer algorithm just has three modifiables, the colours of three balls rendered in the scene, each of which is then read by thousands of computations, the computations that render each pixel in the scene. This one therefore experiences much more contention on the data structures that maintain the sets of readers for each modifiable, and hence has slightly higher overhead. We'll see however on the next slide that this is well compensated by the work savings of doing change propagation. Note that the times for the parallel executions of the algorithm here are pretty similar to the times or the overheads of the times for the single threaded execution. So now the interesting thing to look at is the work savings and parallel speed up of performing change propagation. Work savings refers to the amount of work we save when we run change propagation with one thread compared to running the static algorithm on one thread. We can see that this depends heavily on the size of the dynamic update, k. Note that for the minimum edit distance example, by updating just a single string and running change propagation, it's almost 800,000 times faster than running the entire thing from scratch, which makes sense since we are running on over a million strings here. For filter on a binary search tree, it's about 13,000 times faster. Note then that the parallel speed up is nice and complementary to the work savings. While the work savings decreases as we increase the update size, the parallel speed up increases, which makes sense since there's now more work to parallelize. The two of them are therefore nice and complementary and combine to give good total speed ups, meaning that we save a good amount of work on a variety of different update sizes up until the update sizes start to approach the size of the entire input at which point it's worth just rerunning from scratch. Lastly, we look at our ray tracer example again. In this case, the dynamic update changes the color of one of the balls, which affects about 6% of the pixels in the image. We can see then that change propagation has saved a good amount of work. So to conclude, ours is the first system for parallel self-adjusting computation that has guarantees on its runtime as well as having good practical performance. Some interesting lines of future work would be extending the framework to have fewer assumptions on the algorithms, such as allowing modifiables to be written to multiple times in the same computation. This would allow us to implement some algorithms easier than is possible now with these assumptions. Thank you, and let me know if you have any questions.